Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to say, as been said a couple of times, our, uh, our thoughts and our prayers are with the, the Wilson family. I um, haven't known Charlie for, for very long, but I, I thought it would be, um, I, I felt kind of a, an interesting connection to him. I, I heard, I've been, for those of you that don't, me, don't know me, I, I was a member here in my family. We were, we were members here for number of years left and kind of we're kind of hard to get rid of so <laughs> come back and help out as, as uh, circumstances uh, be necessary uh, but I had heard a lot about Charlie and so we connected on on Facebook and uh, he's like oh I've heard about you too and I'm like well why don't we meet for lunch so this was after he'd been here for, for a couple of months and so I thought well because I'm kind of a transplant to the Chicago area and uh, so I remember one of the, one of the big things that I really liked about Chicago it was Lou Malnati's pizza. I didn't really like it. So I'm like, well, let, I, you know, let's go to Lou Malnati's. So, okay, well, where's the closest one? Is Naperville. So here I'm not thinking. It's Friday, probably May, lunchtime on a Friday, as I said, and it's jam packed. So I had trouble finding a parking spot. And I've been around the Chicago area for ten years or so. And uh, so I heard from Charlie, and he, he was messaging me here, and he was calling me, leaving voicemail, and he's like, well, I think I'm a few minutes away, but I can't find a parking spot. And then a few times it was the same thing again and again, and then he's like, I took a wrong turn, and I'm on a highway, and it says I'm like 10 minutes away. So, <laughs> so, he did, so I, I didn't understand that because I'm, I'm navigationally challenged sometimes myself. So, so, so it happened. So we were able to uh, finally uh, flag him down, get him in, and get a spot. And it was uh, it was a good time. We probably I'm surprised they didn't kick us out of there. We, was, we sat there and talked for uh, two hours, learned about each other, families, and things we've seen as as preachers. And uh, uh, it was real, really good. And I was able to, to see him preach a number of times here uh, while Brookfield was was closed down due to COVID. So it was uh, so we're just wanted to say that we're really. Uh, praying for him and praying for the family. So, this morning what I wanted to talk about is, I had to shorten the title because I, they gave me a hard time at Brookfield on this one because it was, it was really a, a call, giving up the world for, for Jesus. And I thought, well, I'm going to shorten the title and give it up to Jesus and, and or for Jesus. It doesn't mean that we're applauding Jesus, right? It doesn't mean that that's necessarily, but what we're looking at is we're looking at what are we giving up for Jesus and can we give up Jesus as many people did to, in order to, or what are we sacrificing for Jesus? And we have to be careful not to sacrifice our belief in Jesus Christ. Today, giving up, we think about what did Jesus give up for us? He gave up everything. And we're going to read here in a little bit Matthew 4, 1 through 4, where he turned down power, he turned down the world, he turned down everything and was able to say, get behind me, Satan. If we do that today, if we show a contrast to the world, and we, we show that we're, we're not going to be a victim of sin, a victim of temptation, and we're going to say no to, to sin, we cause a disruption, we turn heads. But it shouldn't be heads turned looking at us, it should be looking at God, looking at, at who Christ is. Giving up things for Jesus is not something you do in March or April and put a thing on your head. And, and that Matthew 6 actually speaks against drawing attention to our sacrifices. So why would we draw attention? People have to see who we are through our actions, where they have to discover it. We don't have to just do it ourselves outwardly, but we have to do it inwardly as well. We have to think about the sacrifices, the things that we're going to talk about is making permanent decisions based on temporary circumstances. Are we, are we changing things? Are we putting roots down in this world, realizing that this world is, is temporary? I have a good friend that climbed Mount Everest. Do you want me to go with him? But no. <laughs> I, would, I would literally would, would not have made it. But, uh, but he, he trained for year or two years, something like that. Like, I don't know how many hours he, he logged. And, and he got there, and he went through it all. 
and, and he saw a lot of tragedy on the way. And all the things that he and he finally got to the summit, and to hear him talk about it is just amazing. And and because he does it with visuals and, and everything. And um, he he got there and you know, he has three kids, married, got to the summit, and he thought, everything that I sacrificed, you know, I, I, my life, I could have, you know, like the personal endangerment, all these things, was this all worth it to stand here? And he goes, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, and, and we have to think of, of if it's, when it's our lives, when it's personal, we have to make sure that what we're sacrificing is, is sacrificing things for the world, for accomplishments, to be able to say, I did that, to be able to pat myself on the back. Is that worth it? Or is it better for us to climb a spiritual Everest, to be able to, to do things and, and def defy the world and to be able to accomplish things, but not for ourselves, but for Jesus? So if we could go to the next slide. I want to read Matthew 4, 1 through 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell, me, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So what can we learn from this example? Jesus, when he was in duress, spoke and cited scripture. When he was on the cross, when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's scripture. So there's, there, what that teaches us is that when we are in duress, when we are under stress, when we are being tempted, when we are having emotional issues and challenges and things that we're supposed to face, we have to face it with the Word of God. Because that's what Jesus did. Because a lot of times, the worldly knowledge, and we talked about it in the class, you know, you take the Anthony Robbins courses and talk, talk to you about how the human brain is the most powerful thing in the world, and it's not. God is the most powerful thing in the world. Jesus wasn't flashy, right? He wasn't. Um, someone that, that would, people would necessarily flock to from an aesthetic standpoint, but yet they did because they heard about who he was. They heard about how he had done things. And Jesus called us to take things to, to that next level, to where we took it from the old law, and he challenged us to hold ourselves to a higher standard. And that's what we have to give up for Jesus. Go to the next slide again. <clears throat> what was Jesus' relationship with the world? He was here to save it. He was not here to be a part of it. He was here to be able to, to change things. Today, the, the world tries to retrofit Christ into politics, money. You know, I, I call it this, this news network, Christianity. It's kind of all this, you know, politics and money and Jesus all wrapped up. And here's your, here's your religion. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. He stood apart from the political parties of the day. And there were plenty of them, by the way. He disrupted all that. And he said to separate yourself from them. John 3, 16 through 18 says, for God to love the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. He's got the whole world in his hands. Anybody remember learning that song? I learned that song when I was a little kid. Before I ever knew anything about church or anything, I might, my mom taught me that song. I was like, don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. That would be bad because I don't sing it. <laughs> I leave that to the people in my hands. And, and so 
it's, it's important, though, that we realize that Jesus had the whole world in his hands when he came here. And so does. And we have to, to understand that our relationship with the world should be the same as what his was, was to be in it and not be part of it. My inspiration for this, this sermon actually came from a story from our, uh, our, our minister in, uh, at Brookfield Church of Christ, and he works for the uh, CTA, and uh, so, so the Chicago Transit Authority, and he knew somebody, <laughs> actually saw somebody, that occasionally things happen and things get disrupted, people drop stuff on those tracks. And those train tracks are not your average everyday train track. They're electrified tracks. And so he would see the workers there and they'd look and they go, this guy is convinced that there was a hundred dollar bill on that track. So like, I'm going for it. And all they could think about is, well, you realize you step on the wrong wire, you do this, you know, the train comes through or something, it's like, oh no, no, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm fine. Got in there. He got the bill, right? Got out, didn't hurt himself, luckily. Unfolded the bill. It was a ten dollar bill. Not a hundred dollar bill, it was a ten dollar bill. Would he have done the same sacrifice? This is where I'm talking about we're, t we're making permanent decisions on temporary circumstances. Well, I could really use that hundred dollar bill, make things a little bit easier this week. Great. Well, what about the ten dollar bill? Is it worth your life? to sacrifice that. So we have to think about, are we making permanent decisions, things that could be permanent then on, on temporary circumstances? Mm -hmm. Jesus was able to say no to temptation. Why? Because he was 100% human. He was also 100% God. So he wasn't your average everyday human because he had the wisdom of God, but he was still able to say no to sin. Where did he get his strength from? He got his strength from, from God. He was plugged into the source. I'm saying that assuming that there's a power outlet. Yeah, there is. Okay. And, and so he was plugged into the source. You think about right now with, with cars, right? The big deal is uh, battery powered cars. Some of them look pretty cool. We see some of these Teslas and the different vehicles that are, that are out there. And they can go 350 miles on a charge. And then right now, the big deal is they may be able to get one that can go 1,000 miles on one charge. You can't put gas in it. So you think, okay, so when we're out there, we're on our own strength. We can do things. We can get a little bit. We can do a little bit on our own strength, but eventually we have to recharge. Eventually we run out of power. So we can't use our own batteries that are within us. We have to plug into the source, and that source is God. And it's the same thing that Jesus did. He plugged into the source of power. We can't forget where the power is coming from because if we think it's coming from us, because I was kind of uh, making light of, of Anthony Robbins earlier, if, if everything is coming from us and our power and our great minds and all these things, then then we're we're done because we're flawed. The Bible shows us that that we're flawed. So, what was Jesus' relationship with his disciples? It was real, I think. I think it was, um, he wasn't afraid to correct them, to rebuke them, to, to set them straight, but he loved them. Right? It's just like parenting, like anything else, is you got to say, hey, this is what we expect, this is how it's done, but we love you. It's the same thing with, I think, the way Jesus handled his, his disciples. He was their, their brother, but he was also someone there that was there to correct them and teach them so that they could go and develop the church after he was gone. Did any of his disciples ever disappoint Jesus? Absolutely. Right? But he was able to correct them and, and guide them. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, the last time I was here, is in the boat, the situation with Peter and the boat. Let's read that real quick. Matthew 14, 27 through 31, it says, But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. 
And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith. He said, why did you doubt? But yet the point of this is that the other guys were afraid and they were hiding and cowering in, on the other part of the boat. Peter got out of the boat. Peter didn't fail entirely, right? Peter got out. Peter even walked on the water a little bit. And then all of a sudden, he figured out, oh wait, I'm not the Son of God. I'm not immortal. I'm not all these things. And, and so, so all of a sudden, he realized who he was and he started to sink. How often does that happen to us? When we make decisions, we have faith. We know that we can get there. We do it. We're driving for it. Then all of a sudden, oh yeah, I forgot about that. And we start to sink. And as I mentioned even a couple weeks ago when I was here, is he, he reached out to Jesus. And Jesus caught him. And that's what we have to do. He, again, plugged in to the source. I had this, uh, I meant to put on there, I had faith spelled out in straddle tiles. Anybody play straddle? I just love straddle. I don't play it as much anymore. But you don't always get, one of the good lessons is you don't always get all the, all the letters that you want to make. If there's a word you want to make or you see an opportunity for a word, you don't always get all the letters that you're looking for right away. So you kind of store them up and you wait for that right opportunity if you see something open up. So our faith, I think, builds in that same way. That Peter's faith is building. That's one of the great things about Peter is we see his faith building. At first he just didn't get it, right? And then and over time, and then eventually we see what happens to him. And we're going to look at that here in just a moment. But our faith builds over time. We don't get it all at once. So once you step into this water, it's not instant, but yet you're, you're saved, but over time you start to get it. Like, I didn't understand everything. I remember some of the things I said didn't even make sense, but I remember I understood that Jesus died for me. And I was a little bit scared, but I understood what I was doing, and I had people that, that studied with me. But over time, in, in a few years, yeah, so I guess I would have it. But over, over time, in a few trials, maybe I should say, I started to figure it out. And I started to understand. And I still don't entirely get it. But our faith builds over time. We see things in scriptures. Have you ever done that? You read something when you're 20 in the scripture, and then you read it again, you're 40, and you're like, oh, that's what that is. Okay. God invented just-in-time learning. You hear about that in, like, in corporate worlds and stuff like that? God invented that. It wasn't some corporate education group. So we learn about things as we go, and we see things in the Word that we wouldn't necessarily have seen before. So the difference is, is how we show our faith, and what matters is what is in our heart. Think about Peter versus Judas. So we can go to the next slide. I have Judas, you know, kind of the image of the, the villain <coughs> that lurks in the shadows, waiting to pounce. Because that's what we think of Judas. And he's deceiving Jesus. And we read it and we're like, Jesus, look out, he's the bad guy. Jesus knew exactly who Judas was. There was no deceit going on there. At least not on Jesus' end. There was on Judas' end. But God knew exactly who Judas was. God knew exactly what Judas would do. But yet, Judas still had free will. But he fulfilled prophecy. Judas was a disciple. Was he a villain all the time, 24-7? I don't know. I think some of Jesus' word got in there. And we see that by the end. We see that, that he had that remorse. But he didn't know what to do with that remorse. And he took it to the wrong end. But I believe that Jesus did believe, sorry, Judas did believe who Jesus was and did believe that he was the Savior. And you notice in the scripture here that Jesus calls him friend. You see in Matthew 26, 47 through 50, he said, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him was a large crowd, <coughs> excuse me, armed with swords and clubs, 
sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. So I think that some of Jesus seeped into Judas. That's, that's what I see in the scripture. But Judas didn't know what to do with it. Judas still, after betraying Jesus, still could have turned his life around. Do you think about that? He could have repented. He could have fallen, and he could have said to the Lord, please forgive me. And the Lord would have forgiven him. So many times we think of, okay, well, Judas was a guy that gave up Jesus and allowed Jesus to be crucified. But do we, really, do we realize that, that even Judas' sin was not too big for God to forgive? Judas chose his end. God knew what he would do, but Judas still had free will. Let's look at the story of Peter. Let me change the slide there. I, I use the sword as a symbol for Peter because I always think of, you know, chop in the ear. Peter was that impetuous guy. Peter was ready for a fight, usually. And he was willing to, he wasn't going to be the guy to betray Jesus. He was going to stand, literally did stand in the way of the authorities in between Christ and the authorities. So he was a different kind of personality than what Judas was. But he still gave him up. He still denied him. We see in Matthew 26, 69 through 75. So now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them. All I know is, I, I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again and with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up 